Good afternoon and welcome to the 168th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures began in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We are very pleased today to welcome Dr. Henry Williams Brands to the Landon Podium to join 167 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. We also have a number of Kansas State leaders with us today. And as I call your name, please stand so we can recognize you. Uh, hold your applause until everybody's standing, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chairperson of the Land and Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. You're supposed to remain standing. Uh, Dr. April Mason, Provost. Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, Chair of the Land and Patrons. Dr. Fred Guzik, President of the Faculty Senate and Professor of Marketing at K-State Polytechnic. Pam Warren, President of University Support Staff and Andrew Hertig, K-State Student Body President and Senior in Accounting. We'd we'll also uh, like to introduce a distinguished guest in our audience today, K-State alumnus and former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Richard Myers. Thank you, please join me in. <laughs> Dr. Brands is an American educator, author, and historian. He's written 25 books, as well as published dozens of articles and scores of reviews. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, just to name a few. He is a regular guest on national radio and television programs and is frequently interviewed by the American and foreign press. His writings have been published in several countries and translated into German, French, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Two of his published works entitled Traitor to This Class, The Privileged Life and Radical Presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and The First American were both finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Brand's most recent book, Reagan the Life, is also on the New York Times bestseller list. Dr. Brands is a Jack S. Blanton Senior Chair in History at the University of Texas at Austin. He's an animated lecturer who presents history through stories. He believes that creating an interest in history can result in learning that will continue throughout a student's life. He has also authored and contributes frequently to school textbooks and believes it's critical to write textbooks that engage students. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brands to Kansas State University. Thank you. Thank you. I'll get my son kissed out of your way. Thank you, President Schultz, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be back at Kansas State and to have an opportunity to speak in the Landon Lecture Series. I was looking down the list of previous speakers, and I'm quite flattered to be part of this group. I do teach American history, and I do try to teach, well, using stories. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about what I have learned about the American presidency and about American history. But I'm going to start with a story, and I'm going to... There's a story that is a story that Ronald Reagan used to tell about himself. And it's a story that is set in a small town somewhere in the Midwest, an unidentified small town. A lot of Reagan's stories took place in these small towns. And I think Reagan did this partly because he was the product of a small town in Illinois, Dixon, Illinois, is where he grew up, but also because he understood that if you want to speak to the largest body of Americans, you should probably set it, not in a big city somewhere, even though most Americans live in cities, and you should not set it on one of the coasts, even though most Americans live on one of the coasts. You should put it in the Midwest, because that seems to be the, the heartland of America. So this story is set in some small town in the Midwest, and it's a story that takes place at a moment of Reagan's life and career when things were not going very well. It's set in the late 1950s or the early 1960s. And Ronald Reagan had been a film actor, but his film career had ended. He discovered in the late 1940s that he couldn't get any good roles. He had gone into the politics of the film industry, becoming president of the Screen Actors Guild. But even that gig ended, and he basically got fired 
from his job as a film actor in the sense you get fired nobody wanted to make movies with him anymore so he got demoted from the big screen of film to the small screen the tiny screen in those days of television now Reagan liked to spin things in the most positive way possible but he understood that things were not going well in, in fact when I say he got demoted to the small screen his TV appearances lasted all of about three minutes once a week he was host of the General Electric Theater and this was basically these were plays made for television and Reagan didn't even get a part in the plays he just introduced the plays and then he was gone the rest of the time the rest of his work week he traveled the country speaking on behalf of the General Electric Company actually more precisely speaking on behalf of GE management he was he'd gone from films to public relations he was a flack for GE management this was not what he had envisioned when he was a kid growing up in Dixon Illinois and watching the movies on the screen up there and imagining that could be him he had had his shot he had gotten some parts but he just didn't have it in him to be an a-list actor so now he is trying to figure out what to make of being a spokesman for GE people around the country if they ever knew who he was they've pretty much forgotten as exemplified by this story so the story goes that Reagan is about to give a talk in this small town it's a lunchtime talk and he's going to be speaking to it could have been the Chamber of Commerce or the Rotary Club or some group like that and the guy who is going to introduce him is shown the program here's the program and the speaker is this guy named Ronald R E A G A N and the guy does not know how to pronounce the last name is it Reagan or is it Regan it could quite plausibly be either one and this guy simply does not know now he's a polite fellow a sensitive guy and he doesn't want to embarrass the guest by mispronouncing his name and so he doesn't you know so what am I gonna do now I tell this story to my students and in this day of ubiquitous information and the internet and YouTube and everything else it would be no problem but I point out to them there was a time when those did not exist believe it or not and so this guy in his quandary this again the small town he goes out for a walk uh, just a couple hours before the lunch and he's walking around like this and he's thinking really hard okay what am I gonna do because I say he doesn't want to embarrass himself doesn't want to embarrass the guest while he's walking walking along like this he bumps into a friend a neighbor well actually he bumps into the neighbor's dog because he's walking down with his head down and he almost trips over the dog and the neighbor says gee you look like you're deep in thought you look like you're in a problem is everything okay and the guy starts to explain his dilemma but he gets he starts to talk and then he, oh he just reaches in his pocket and he pulls out the program and he hands it to the guy this the fellow walking the dog and he says uh, do you know how to pronounce this guy's name do you know who he is and the guy looks at it and says, oh yeah yeah he used to be a, a, a movie actor I don't know what he's doing now but oh, but uh, it's it's Reagan it's Ronald Reagan and the guy who's gonna introduce him says really are you now you sure oh yeah it's Reagan you say Reagan you'll be fine and so the guy starts walking off he says, oh boy thanks you know he's got Reagan 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 and he again trips over the dog and he says to the guy oh well by the way that's a, a cute dog you've got there what kind of dog is it a bagel okay now I want you to just try to hold in your memory that that ripple of laughter that went around I told this for a particular reason and I'll come back and explain what the reason is and it's not just to, to start with a joke but but actually that is part of the reason but there's a, a reason for that reason 
So I wrote this book about Ronald Reagan. And as the biographer, as the historian, I'm trying to figure this person out. The reason I wrote about Reagan is that he was a very important figure in American public life, in world affairs in the second half of the 20th century. That's the reason I wrote about Reagan. But having made the decision to write about Reagan, I wanted to find out as much as I could about the guy. This is a biography. It's not simply just a study of his presidency. And I used to, I sometimes would write books that were simply studies of presidencies. But the more I did it, the more I realized that that simply scratched the surface and didn't explain what needed to be explained. And what needed to be explained was why these presidents, why these leaders, why individuals do what they do. And actually, this, this aspect of it started out years ago. I was going to write a study of the presidency of, actually, the foreign policy of Theodore Roosevelt. And I started studying the foreign policy of Theodore Roosevelt when I realized you can't simply write about the foreign policy of a president without writing about the domestic policy. Because presidents are presidents not simply of foreign affairs, they're presidents of the whole country. And very often, what is happening in domestic affairs influences what's happening in foreign affairs and vice versa. So you have to study the whole presidency. But then having gone that far, I realized, well, you can't just act as though this person was dropped down sort of in the White House on January 20th of his, his inauguration year as though nothing had happened before. The people who make these decisions are not simply presidents. These are flesh and blood individuals. And if you want to understand why they act the way they do, you need to try to understand them as individuals. So this is what really led me to the genre of biography. And eventually, I wrote, and I'm pleased to say, that Reagan is the final volume, a series of six biographies that covers American history from the 18th century to the present. But I'm going to focus on Reagan. And the question is, well, I, I faced what has been called the enigma of Ronald Reagan. Now, everybody's an enigma. And nobody is easy to understand. But I had a suspicion that Reagan wasn't going to be that much harder to understand than other people. Despite this, despite the reputation that had grown up around him. And much of it originated with Reagan's official biographer, a historian biographer named Edmund Morris, who was given unprecedented access to Reagan while Reagan was in the White House. And finally proclaimed to be so defeated by understanding Reagan that he sort of threw up his hands. And instead of writing a biography of Reagan, which is what he had been commissioned to do, he wrote a very odd, fictionalized memoir of Reagan, where he creates this fictional character who follows Reagan around during his life and is able to report from the side. Now, a, a lot of people who ex were a lot of people who were expecting an authoritative account of Reagan's life were disappointed. The people in the Reagan family, the people who knew Reagan, who sat for the interviews with the author, were outraged by this because it seemed essentially an insult. You know, we gave you all this time, and you don't even make this, you don't tell a straight-up account of this individual's life. And Morris, um, you know, he's a wonderful writer, and he, he professed to be defeated. He said, Reagan is this enigma. I just can't understand him. Well, okay, I'm going to sort of jump forward a little bit to tell you that there is an enigma about Ronald Reagan, but it's not that one. It's not the enigma of what made Reagan tick. It's the enigma of what made Reagan successful. And these are two rather different things. Now, I'm going to tell you that I think I know what made Reagan tick. You can decide for yourselves whether you think I'm right, because one of the things that I have learned in the 40 years, 35 years of sort of teaching history, writing history, is that one's interpretation of history depends as much on one's view of human nature as it does on any particular set of facts. Especially when you get to these questions, why do people do what they do? I can sort of point out the circumstances, the, the alternatives, the decision points and all this, 
But when you get down to the question, so why did that person do that? Then I can give you my interpretation, but you're free to have your interpretation, which might reflect your own particular view of human nature. So I was working on Ronald Reagan. Actually, I started working on Reagan, as I often do, uh, while my previous book was in the production process. So it usually takes about a, a year from the time you finish the manuscript of a book to the time it's actually published. So during that year, if you're going to make good use of your time, you start on your next project. So this previous book was on Ulysses Grant. And I was doing a book tour for the, to support the book. And I was giving a radio interview to this radio host based in Chicago. And so we talked about Ulysses Grant. We had a good interview. And at the end of the interview, toward the end of the interview, he did what people often do uh, on these interviews. He uh, said, so who's your next project? And I said, I'm writing about Ronald Reagan. And he put his hand over the microphone. And he said, when we get off the air, there's something I need to tell you. OK, I'm all ears. And I thought, OK, this is Illinois. And he's of an age where, I don't know, maybe his aunt dated Ronald Reagan and had love letters that no one had seen. So the interview ends. We go off the air. I'm waiting. And he says, if you want to understand Ronald Reagan, you need to keep one thing foremost in mind. And that is that Ronald Reagan was the son of an alcoholic father. When he said this, I didn't know how he expected me to respond. Because I didn't know if he thought that he was giving me information that I didn't have. Because I knew that Reagan was the son of an alcoholic father. Reagan wrote two memoirs. And in both of them, he explains that his father was an alcoholic. So not knowing quite where he was going with this, I just kept quiet. And he went on to say, I speak as the son of an alcoholic father. And he said, when you grow up in a situation like this, you develop a characteristic emotional approach to the world. You grow up realizing that the person on whom you most want to rely, the one who's supposed to be your emotional pillar of support, the one that you want to model yourself after is the most unreliable person in the world. And one day, you're tossing the ball around in the backyard, and he's telling you funny stories. He takes you out for ice cream. You think he's the greatest guy there is. And the next day, he's beating the living daylights out of you. And when you wake up in the morning, you don't know which of these two you're going to be dealing with. And as a result, you build this wall around yourself. And you can be friendly. You can appear extroverted. But there's always this reserve. There's always a part you keep to yourself. Because you've learned you can't let yourself out there without suffering this kind of pain. This is what he told me. So I listened. And I thought, OK, um, this is this individual's experience. Maybe it will shed some light on Ronald Reagan. I'm not going to take his word for it, but I'm going to be open to the possibility. So I continue my research on Ronald Reagan. I reread some sources. And there are two personal accounts, two sources, that seemed to corroborate what he said. Two in particular. One was the memoir of Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, Reagan's second wife, his dearest partner, the one who was sort of the sum of Reagan's emotional world. Reagan was closer to Nancy than he was to anyone else in his life, anyone else on earth. And she reciprocated. They were this wonderful couple. Their marriage is a terrific one of the greatest love stories of American public life in the last, in the 20th century, even at continuing into the early part of the 21st century. And Nancy, who always called her husband Ronnie, said that she knew Ronnie better than anyone else on earth. And that is quite true. 
But she went on to say, but there were things that even I didn't know. There were times when that wall would come up. And I wouldn't know what he was thinking. I wouldn't know what was in his heart. And I would simply have to wait until he would let the wall down, let me back in. I thought if Nancy Reagan said that, well, there, that's, there's a lot to that. Nancy was insightful. This was her husband. She was closer to him than anyone else. So that was one bit of evidence that seemed to indicate that what the radio host had said might apply to Reagan. The second bit of evidence came from Reagan's own hand. I was going to say his mouth, but it was actually in his memoir. He tells the story of a moment when he is 11 years old, living in Dixon, Illinois. It's a winter day. It's late afternoon. He's gone to the local YMCA for an after-school event. He comes home. There's snow on the ground. The temperature is below freezing. It's getting dark. He comes off the sidewalk. He turns the walkway to his house. And there is his father, passed out, face down, drunk in the snow. And Reagan remembers this from 70 years later. He's writing this memoir at the age of 80. So he's, and he's 11 years old. And he remembers, and he says this in the memoir, that I stood there for a moment and I asked myself, should I just walk on by and go on inside? And he entertained the thought. He didn't tease out in the memoir what the consequences of that would be, but it was pretty obvious that his father would freeze to death in the snow. Now, in the next sentence, Reagan says, well, I decided I ought to pick him up, drag him in. And he does. And sort of all ends okay. But the fact that Seven decades later, he remembers stopping and thinking at the age of 11 that his life might be better if his father were dead. And that's quite an experience for a young boy to have and to carry sort of for the rest of his life. Okay, so on all sorts of evidence, Reagan was this person who was friendly but friendless. Reagan had essentially no friends, close individuals other than Nancy, in whom he confided his hopes and fears. I exaggerate slightly, but only slightly, when I say that if he hadn't been president of the United States, if he hadn't been this famous public figure, nobody would have come to his funeral except Nancy. And you know, probably the kids, but the fact that he invested himself entirely in Nancy very often left the kids feeling on the outside. Now, as he grew old and he spent the last 10 years of his life suffering from Alzheimer's, they sort of softened toward their father and so they did show up. But he was this person who seemed friendly from a distance, but the closer you got, the more you realize there was this basic reserve there. You could never get very close and that's the way he wanted it. Okay, so that's kind of the personal side of Reagan. And you can decide for yourself whether you think that explains the Reagan personality, the Reagan temperament. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm gonna, I mean, th that explained it enough for my purposes. The next question, the other part of the Reagan enigma. So, as I say, I think I, I, think I know what made him tick. The question of what made him successful that's harder because here's this guy. I told you about him addressing this group in some small Midwestern town. At a time when his career was going nowhere, where people didn't remember who he was, you know, even, even those people who knew him from Hollywood saw nothing in Reagan particularly. In fact, when Reagan did enter politics and announced that he was going to run for governor of California, Samuel Goldwyn, of uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayor said, no, no, Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. So that's how he was viewed, kind of a lightweight, and not somebody sort of up to the political demands of being governor and then being president, being leader of the free world. But Reagan became, I would argue, 
one of the two most consequential presidents of the 20th century. I would say that what Franklin Roosevelt was in the first half of the 20th century for the United States and for the world, Reagan was to the second half of the 20th century. Reagan changed the world. Reagan changed American domestic politics by turning the conversation in the United States in a conservative direction. From the beginning of the 20th century, and certainly from the New Deal era of Franklin Roosevelt, the trend line in American politics was in a liberal direction, in a direction of greater government involvement in the lives of ordinary Americans. And the New Deal gives rise to the Great Society of the 1960s, and so government becomes larger, government becomes more ambitious. This because that's what American voters wanted. When American voters re-elected Franklin Roosevelt overwhelmingly in 1936, over, do you know who he defeated in 1936? Half Landon. American voters were saying, we want bigger government. We want more ambitious government. We want more energetic government. But in time, Americans changed their minds. And when Ronald Reagan was re-elected, when he was elected first in 1980 and then re-elected in 1984, by a comparable margin to that which re-elected Franklin Roosevelt in 1936, but this time, on behalf of a conservative president, it demonstrated that Americans had changed their mind. It also demonstrated that Alf Landon lived half a century too soon. Anyway, so for me, the biographer and the student of the presidency, I have to explain how did Reagan accomplish what he accomplished. First, what did he accomplish? He shifted American politics in a conservative direction. I can say that from Franklin Roosevelt until the end of the 1970s, this country lived in, I'll call it the age of Roosevelt. Again, the liberal tide was flowing. Americans expected more and more out of government. Reagan comes in and says that no, it's time for a change. In fact, if you want to distinguish liberals from conservatives in this country on the basic political issues, leave aside social issues, that complicates things. But you are a liberal in the United States in the modern era if you believe that government is the solution to important social problems. You are a conservative if you agree with Ronald Reagan in his first inaugural address where he said the government is not the solution, government is the problem. And I would argue, I'd suggest, that Reagan accomplished that part of his mission so well that we still largely live in the age of Reagan. In the age of Roosevelt, Americans believed that government could affect positive change in their lives. People had confidence in government. In the age of Reagan, people have nothing but disdain for government. It's hard to find people, almost of either party, really, maybe leave aside Bernie Sanders, um, who think that government really gets stuff done, that government is efficient, that government can be a force for positive change. Now, Reagan actually dreamed of shrinking government at home. That was a step too far. Americans weren't going to give up Social Security. Reagan had been opposed to Social Security. They weren't going to give up Medicare. Reagan had been opposed to Medicare. He believed in the private route on those issues. But he was also a realist. And he recognized that, OK, Americans have become used to Social Security. They like Social Security. They become used to Medicare. They like Medicare. But from Reagan until now, the growth rate of government slowed dramatically. If you simply look at the number of new programs, New federal programs came thick and fast during Franklin Roosevelt's presidency, thicker and faster during the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. New federal programs came slowly and painfully from Reagan forward. And the best example of slow and painful is the Affordable Care Act, which is still sort of struggling for its existence six years after it was passed. Anyway, so Reagan changes the conversation in America on domestic issues. In foreign affairs, Reagan changes the face of the international system. Reagan had two goals as president. One was to shrink government at home. The other one was to defeat communism abroad. And that second, that second was much more radical 
than is commonly appreciated. From Harry Truman, the president at the onset of the Cold War, through Jimmy Carter, president just before Ronald Reagan, the basic position of American presidents, of the American national security establishment was that the Soviet Union, communism is here to stay. And we need simply to deal with it. And this was exemplified most clearly by the policy of detente inaugurated by Richard Nixon in the 1970s. But Reagan, Reagan said, no, no. We're not going to live with communism. We're not going to coexist with communism. We're going to defeat communism. Now, I don't have time to go into how all this happened. I would be the last person to say that Reagan defeated communism by himself. One of the secrets of success of a president is living at the right time and having things happen, things fall your way. Ronald Reagan's policy toward the Soviet Union, toward communism, required Mikhail Gorbachev or somebody like him for it to take effect. Reagan had been trying to engage Soviet leaders in discussions leaning toward arms control, but as he said, they kept dying on him. And then along comes Mikhail Gorbachev, who's willing to talk. And they achieve a breakthrough in arms control. But more importantly, Reagan staked the moral position of the United States in a famous speech that he gave in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin in 1987, where he stood in front of the Berlin Wall and he challenged Gorbachev. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, if you are serious about reform, come to Berlin. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This is 1987. Reagan leaves office in 1989. The wall is still standing. In fact, when Reagan uttered those words, almost nobody took them seriously. Almost nobody in the obvious positions of authority took them seriously. Gorbachev and the Soviet PR people, they just said, ah, it's just more of the same. What can you expect out of a Hollywood actor? And people in the United States said, oh, he's just trying to inflame this. He's trying to distract people from the Iran-Contra scandal, which had broken just a few months before. And he's flailing. He's in the last two years of his administration. But there were people who were listening. And those people were the ones on the other side of the Berlin Wall, in East Berlin itself, in East Germany, in Poland. And when they had their opportunity in 1989 to themselves take the physical risk to tear down the wall, they remembered that the President of the United States had staked out this moral position basically saying, we're on your side. And any number of them who were asked about this, so what did you know about this, what we were thinking? They said, we remembered what President Reagan said. And the wall did fall. And a short while later, the Soviet Union disintegrated. Reagan was once asked, so what in, you know, what is your policy toward communism, toward the Soviets? He said, it's simple. We win, they lose. And we won, they lost. And so Reagan had two goals as president. He wanted to shrink government at home. He wanted to defeat communism abroad. He got all of the second. He slowed down the growth of government at home. Part of it was at the cost of, well, part of it was the cost of, this is going to sound paradoxical, a very large federal deficits. Reagan took the Republican Party and with sort of the Republican Party, fiscal conservatives, across a Rubicon from which they have never come back. Before Reagan, the litmus test of a conservative, of a political conservative in the United States on financial fiscal issues was the balanced budget. You know, you, government has to live within its means the way families live within their means. That's the position that Reagan staked out when he was campaigning in 1980. It's the position he stated in 1981, but, but it is the position he gave up in 1981 in the course of negotiations, political fighting over taxes and spending. Reagan believed that taxes should come down. He believed that spending should come down. And he proposed a budget doing both. But when he discovered that he didn't have the political momentum, the political clout to get the budget cuts this year, he accepted a deal in which 
taxes were cut today in exchange for a promise of spending cuts tomorrow. And one of the things that Reagan learned, maybe he knew, maybe he simply overestimated his political persuasiveness. He discovered that tax cuts are written in stone and spending cuts are written on paper, which is very flimsy paper. He never got those tax, he never got the spending cuts that he wanted. The result was, and this is quite ironic for someone who claimed to be a fiscal conservative. Reagan's administration rolled up as much federal debt as every administration before him, from George Washington to Jimmy Carter. The federal debt doubled in real terms. It tripled in nominal terms. It doubled in real terms during the Reagan years. The result of that, I mean, one of the consequences of this is that the Republican Party is no longer the party of a balanced budget. This is Reagan's party. I mean, they still talk about a balanced budget, but it is the party of tax cuts. Tax cuts in good weather, tax cuts in bad weather, tax cuts under any circumstances. Now, this is not, well, I should say, Reagan was sort of responsible for creating this, but one of the questions that I get asked is, so what would Reagan think of his party today? What would he think of politics today? And I would say, oh, actually, one form that the question takes is, how would Ronald Reagan fare as a candidate today? Could Ronald Reagan get the nomination of his old party? And the answer I give sounds like kind of historian's dodge, but it's not really. I said, if Reagan had never been president of the United States, I think he would compete very well for the nomination of the Republican Party today. And partly because Reagan wa it was um, an engaging personality. Even though he didn't have close friends, he was friendly. And, oh, you know why I told you that story at the beginning? Because Reagan had a sense of humor. And Reagan understood how to use that sense of humor. Reagan began nearly every speech with a joke. And the joke was kind of a shaggy dog story like that one, where you heard that sort of ripple of laughter, not just belly laughs, ha, 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 you know, and, and nobody says, boy, that's the cleverest thing I've ever heard, but just, ah, hey, that's kind of funny. Reagan, in those years, when he was on the GE circuit and giving all those lunchtime speeches, he learned that laughter is a great way to dissolve skepticism. He understood that if you can get audiences to laugh with you, you're halfway to getting them to agree with you. Reagan was, in addition, somebody, something, who's almost unique in modern American political history, an optimistic conservative. Think about it for a minute. Conservatives are, by their nature, pessimists. I mean, the reason you're a conservative, that is, you think that change is generally for the worse. And you just want to hold on tightly to what we have, because things are going to get worse if you don't. Well, Reagan was a conservative, but he was also an optimist. Reagan preached a message of hope. Now, the message that's being preached by candidates today, especially on the Republican side, is anything but hope. It's fear and anger. And Reagan, I think, would be, I think he'd clean up in that part of it, precisely because he's this appealing personality. And Americans want to vote their hope. They voted for Reagan in 1980 because he said America remains the shining city on a hill. And rem Amer the American dream still lives. And America's brightest days are ahead. He was re-elected in 1984 on a slogan of, it's morning in America. You know, I'm not hearing that morning in America these days in politics. So if Reagan were a candidate today, not having been president, I think he could probably get the nomination. The problem is that Reagan was, in fact, president. And I say that's a problem because Reagan was 100% a rhetorical conservative. And Reagan's speeches, 
Reagan gave essentially the same speech during his entire political career. He burst onto the scene with a speech on behalf of Barry Goldwater in 1964. His last speech was his farewell address in 1989. So a quarter century where he's given the same speech again and again. It's always smaller government at home, defeat communism abroad. He really stuck to his message. The details, the anecdotes changed, but the message was always the same. And he was, as I say, this consistent conservative. And so, conservatives today, Republicans, can cite Ronald Reagan's speeches. He's their guy. But the trouble arises if they have to look at Ronald Reagan's record as president. It's a problem for the real hardcore conservatives because Reagan was the last thing from hardcore. Reagan was a pragmatist. Reagan believed that the point in getting elected was to govern. And to govern in a pluralist democracy means taking account of the fact that other people have their own views on things and they have a right to their own views. Reagan, well in fact, when I was writing the book, I interviewed surviving members of the Reagan administration. And I talked to James Baker, who was Reagan's chief of staff and then his secretary of the treasury. And Baker told me, he quoted Reagan, and he said, if Reagan told me once, he told me 15,000 times. I'd rather get 80% of what I want than go over the cliff with my flags flying. This was Reagan. Reagan understood that in politics in the real world, when you are in office and intend to govern, you make progress incrementally. You don't insist that the perfect become the enemy of the good. If you get 80% today, that's a really good day. Take it and bank that, come back tomorrow and see if you can get more of the rest. So if Reagan had to defend his record as president in Republican primary seasons, oh, I can just imagine what would be said of Reagan. Reagan is known as the president who slashed taxes, and indeed he did, in one big right at the beginning. But he proceeded to raise taxes several times after that much smaller amounts, but because those tax increases were necessary, for example, to shore up Social Security. Reagan recognized that Social Security was a reality. And since it was a reality, he was going to make it fiscally sound. And this required substantial increases in Social Security taxes. Reagan was the last president to seriously revise, reform, streamline the tax code. This was in 1986, which was a remarkable accomplishment given that it was in his last term as president. Second term presidents almost rarely get much done done. But Reagan reformed the tax code. And he did it on a basis that was overall revenue neutral. So on the whole, it leveled out. The point wasn't to raise taxes on the whole or reduce taxes on the whole. But it meant that some people's taxes went up. Now these days, he would be branded as a tax raiser. And we're not going to have that. And Reagan was the last president to preside over important immigration reform. It wasn't everything that Reagan wanted, but it recognized the reality of lots of people who had come into this country illegally. And he said, they are here. We have to do something about it. So Reagan would be a sitting duck for the kind of rhetoric that is used by conservatives these days against their opponents. But again, that's because he was president. Now, needless to say, none of the other candidates for president has been president, so they don't have to deal with that sort of thing. I said that I had, a, had the, there was this sort of enigma of how did Reagan do it? Why was he successful? It wasn't because he was the smartest person ever to occupy the White House. I can name five or six presidents whose raw IQ was probably higher than Reagan's. And we could start with Jimmy Carter. But Reagan understood that being, when you are president, there's such a thing, you have to be smart enough. But being a whole lot smarter than smart enough is probably no advantage. And it might even be a disadvantage. Somebody like Jimmy Carter, for example, was tempted to try to master all aspects of governance. Reagan didn't even try. And, but he did understand 
that a president can't change the waterfront of politics and world affairs, but if he focuses on a couple of things, if he says, shrink government at home, defeat communism abroad, and you work on those things, then you can get some motion. Reagan understood that it's absolutely essential to have the American people on your side. Reagan took as his model of how to be president, not, not the policies to follow, but how to be president, Franklin Roosevelt. Reagan started his career sort of be, um, on the air as a radio announcer. At the time when Franklin Roosevelt was giving his fireside chats, and Reagan listened to those fireside chats and he understood that's the way a president has power. It's not the number of votes you have in Congress, it's the connection you make with the American people, the ability to convey a vision. What Roosevelt did in the depths of the Depression, Reagan did during the end of the 1970s, which were a troubling time for Americans, and during his time as president. Reagan understood the value of humor. Reagan could tell a joke, he could get people to laugh, and when they laughed with him, they found that they couldn't dislike him, and many of them came around to agree with him. One last thing. Reagan benefited from coming along at a time in American politics when it was still possible to have bipartisan measures, have important measures receive bipartisan support. Until just a very quick summary of American sort of political parties, until the 1960s, every, the two major American political parties were always ideological, ide, ideological coalitions. There were liberal Republicans as well as conservative Republicans. There were conservative Democrats as well as liberal Democrats. This changed when Lyndon Johnson nailed the mast of the National Democratic Party to, nailed the flag to the mast of civil rights reform, giving all those Southern conservatives an excuse to leave the Democratic Party of their fathers and grandfathers, which they had been in since the Civil War, and go to the party to which they were more closely affiliated, philosophically, the Republican Party. So there's this grand migration of conservatives out of the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Reagan becomes president in the 1980s when the migration is half accomplished. But there were still conservative Democrats. And every one of Reagan's important pieces of legislation, he got a substantial number of Democratic votes. So he could present these positions as bipartisan. He could portray himself as the president of all the people. The migration of conservatives out of the, Repub out of the Democratic Party ended about the year 2000. Since then, there have been essentially no liberals in the Republican Party, no conservatives in the Democratic Party. If Reagan became president in 2017, he would have a whole lot harder time accomplishing what he accomplished. But we historians have the advantage of leaving people in their place and moment in history and appreciating what they accomplished there. Thank you very much. We do have time for a couple questions, so if anybody has a question, I think come down the aisles and we have some microphones. Yes, ma'am. Anybody that wants to speak here, come on up. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I was just going to ask, as sure. you uh, uh, did your research and, and talked to all these different people, who was the most intriguing individual that probably helped shape a lot of what you uh, discussed today? I'm going to mention two people. One was James Baker, who gave me a great interview in his office in Houston. Baker was gracious enough to talk to me. I'm sure that he has inter been interviewed a thousand times on his long and distinguished career. I wasn't in his office but five minutes when I saw what any number of people who said he's going to come work for me, saw in him. I imagined that I was, let's say, a candidate for president in, I don't know, let's just pick a year out of the year, 2000. 
and the race was really close, and it seemed to hang on a recount in Florida. Who would I want to argue my case? Somebody who understood the law, somebody who understood politics, somebody who could be very strong on your side in the most genteel way. So I understand why Jim Baker had the career he had. So, oh, and he was, he told me some stories. <laughs> the ground rules were that these were in deep background. So he basically, he would tell me the stories, he let me record them, but I couldn't use them in the book unless I checked. Can I use this? Yeah, you can use that. And he told me some stories that I wish I could repeat to you. Uh, they're great stories, but he didn't let me use them. A wonderful raconteur. The other one was John Poindexter. John Poindexter was the national security advisor when the Iran-Contra story broke. And Poindexter, I had sort of observed from the distance that everybody else observed him in the 1980s. And he was a Navy admiral who had you know, gone to work for the White House. And he seemed sort of like this buttoned up, gray kind of guy who, um, you know, which just wouldn't be a very interesting guy. Well, in fact, when I talked to him, he looked like Santa Claus. And he was, he had the most jovial laugh. And he just wanted to talk, and it was great. But one of the things he told me was something that I decided not to use in the book exactly. And what he said was, oh, one of the things I asked him was, did you feel as though you had been tossed under the bus when the story of the Iran-Contra scandal broke? And just to remind you, the administration was caught sending weapons to Iran against it, which it had declared and was trying to enforce an embargo, an arms embargo, in exchange for the release of American hostages, which in fact didn't get released, so the United States got suckered on that, and then taking the proceeds from those sales and using them to fund the Contras illegally after Congress had declared that you, no U.S. funds should be used to fund the Contras. And so the story broke, and Reagan fired Poindexter. And I said, so did you feel kind of bitter at this, that you had been sacrificed? Not at all. He said, that, was, that came with the job. And he told me convincingly that he had kept information from the president, precisely because, as he said, that was my job. The National Security Advisor is expendable. The President of the United States is not. Now, Reagan clearly knew that the arms were going to Iran. And he knew that there was a connection to the hostages. That's in his diary. But then, when the story breaks, Reagan gets up in front of the cameras on television and says, this was not arms for hostages. And so, I asked Poindexter, I said, so how did he, how did he do this? I can read the diary, and it's really clear. Arms for hostages, again and again. And, but Reagan stands up and says with a perfectly straight face, this was not arms for hostages. And I said, you know, I didn't think Reagan was that good an actor. And Poindexter said that he thought that this was evidence of the incipient dementia, that Reagan would be, di he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's after he left the White House. And Poindexter thought that this was an early symptom of that. It was, and I didn't use it explicitly in the book because I wanted sort of, sort of more corroborating evidence before making a claim that the president was losing his memory while still president. One of the ways I dealt with it though was to, and I, I felt sort of badly doing this, but after Reagan left the White House, he was asked to give testimony in a number of the investigations and prosecutions of members of his administration, by now former administration, um, in the Iran-Contra scandal. And he gives uh, one deposition, and this is a little over two years after he left the White House. And in the space of about two and a half hours, he's asked one question after another. These are factual questions, and he has to say, I don't remember, I don't recall, I can't say. And at first these are questions that anybody might not recall. So 
what did you do on this particular day? Presidents are busy, who can remember? But then they became sort of very basic questions, like, do you remember who your chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was? No, I don't. And then it became even more specific than that. Do you remember who Michael Deaver was? Michael Deaver was sort of the oldest of the Reagan loyalists from California days. The one of all the Californians who came to Washington and was closest to the president and Mrs. Reagan. And he confessed now, he's just two years out of the White House, he cannot remember who Michael Deaver is. And at the end of this session, very painful session, painful even to read, he said something that is just sort of almost chilling. He said, and again, just 25 months or so after he leaves the White House, he said, it's like I was never president at all. His memory of the presidential years was gone. And, you know, to, to figure out, so what does one make of this? And various people, Poindexter saw evidence earlier on. Reagan's son, Ron, some of you may remember, uh, in 1984, Ronald Reagan had two debates against Walter Mondale. And the first debate went really badly for Reagan. And uncharacteristically, Reagan fumbled his opening statement. He circled around and repeated verbatim sections of his closing statement. This was a guy who was trained as an actor. And as an actor, he knew his lines. He, you know, he, he didn't mess up his lines. And he really performed badly. And Ron Reagan, his son, said that's when he saw the first signs of his father's mental decline. The next day, the Wall Street Journal, the Republican and Reagan-friendly Wall Street Journal, ran a banner headline. Is Reagan too old to be president? Do you remember how Reagan resolved that question? In the second debate, he prepared a one-liner, which he sort of dropped in as spontaneous, but if you go over it, it's not spontaneous at all, because it, it's not responding to the thing that came up. But given the slightest opportunity, he said that on this age issue, he has made a determination that he will not use his opponent's youth and inexperience against him. And if you watch the video of it, there is this ripple of relieved laughter that runs through the studio audience, and even Mondale himself laughs. And it's, as I say, it's not, it's not laughter of, boy, that was a good one. No, it's laughter of, whew, we don't have to worry about our president losing his mind. But if you think about it for a minute, it didn't prove anything at all. It proved that he had a sense of humor. It didn't prove that he had a memory. But nonetheless, people liked Reagan, and they kept him around. Long answer to a question. That's right. Do you have a question over here? Um, I was wondering what you attribute your vocabulary to. <laughs> I had to have a, a dictionary app open when I read the book. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't intend for that. I'll tell you, I'll, so I'll use this as an excuse for explaining how I got into this business at all. It started when my father, now deceased, took me and my three siblings on Sunday afternoon drives around Portland, Oregon, where we grew up. It was his contribution to child rearing. My father and my mother had a very traditional approach. So my dad, he was one of these people who worked six days a week. He had his own business. But on Sundays, he would take the kids out of my mom's hair. She would stay home. My dad had always had this interest in history. He also was trained as an engineer. So we used to go around to big public works projects, the Bonneville Dam, the Portland Water Works. We followed the trail of Lewis and Clark. So I had this interest in history. And so I started reading historical stuff. I also had a grandmother who used to, what shall I say, incentivize, she used to bribe us to, she thought that it was useful to improve one's memory by memorizing poetry. So we would get paid a nickel for memorizing a short poem, 10 cents for a little bit longer one, 25 cents for the raven and the highwayman. And so maybe that was some of it. But from the earliest time, I loved to read stories. I read a lot. I still read, although I you know, write too. And so this appreciation for the language and what you can do with it, uh, I guess it came fairly early on. I guess that's an answer to your question. I hope. Oops, please join me in thanking Dr. Brands for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.